Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is where we're going to take our text. If you were here for Sunday school, you're going to find out that this goes along with our Sunday school lesson. If you were not here, well, shame on you, and, and uh, <laughs> you'll get a little taste of what Sunday school lesson <laughs> kind of covered. Not really, but, but it um, does go along with it. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, when you found your place, would you stand with me? As we read verse number 14 as our text, as our starting place. We'll read other scriptures, but we're going to start out with Ecclesiastes 3.14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. Let's pray. Dear Father, we bow in your house once again this morning. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, that what you do, it shall stand, that men can't undo, can't take away. Father, we thank you that um, you've made salvation uh, possible. Uh, you made, made a way for us to be saved and, and justified before you, and we thank you for that. And I want to ask you today that you'd call men, women, boys, and girls unto you, unto Jesus Christ, unto salvation, that your name may be uh, praised and, and glorified. Jesus may be uplifted and uh, your church edified. Father, we, we just thank you for uh, the ones that are here and the ones that we'll view later. We ask for your blessings upon your word that you would accomplish much, that you would save souls and encourage hearts. In Jesus we pray, amen. The fact is that we live in uncertain times, don't we? I think we could agree with that. Maybe the most uncertain of times of our lifetime. Of course, that probably could be said of every uh, generation, but uh, right now the things that we face are, at least in our lifetimes, unprecedented. COVID um, put aside the health issues that uh, we don't know where the perils are coming from or what, or whether we're going to be exposed or not exposed or how our body will react uh, to the virus if we are exposed. Put aside all of that, but what about the shutdowns? The, the businesses have been told they couldn't operate, uh, or, or, or at least not at, at full capacity. And listen, whenever you're trying to get by in a, in a cafe or a restaurant, and you can't have but 25 or 50 percent, you can't pay the bills on that. And so businesses are, are in jeopardy, and they tell us a vaccine is coming. I read this week that Fauci promised an AIDS vaccine in the 1980s. We're still waiting on that one. I don't know if we'll get a vaccine or not. We continue to pray and, and uh, ask God for deliverance. And those. All I'm saying is we're living in uncertain times, aren't we? Maybe some of the most uncertain of our lifetime. We have a, an election upcoming. And I want to tell you something. As a Christian person, you have an obligation to examine the candidate See how they stand on the issues, issues of life, issues of morality, how they stand on the issues and compare that to the Word of God. And you have an obligation as a Christian to vote accordingly. Do their, most of their values line up with this Word or not? And uh, I'm not talking about party lines or what. I'm talking about do they agree with God's Word, principles, and teachings? And so, uh, uh, listen, I, I believe this. We are in danger of losing our country. We are in danger of losing our way of life. If there's ever been an election that's important, this one upcoming is. I urge you to pray, pray, pray now. Pray diligently. Pray, pray throughout. And then vote. Um, even our very lives are uncertain, aren't they? James, in chapter 4, and verse 14 said, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. So even our lives are uncertain. In Hebrews, we read about how Abraham sojourned and and he looked for something permanent. I think that's one thing we could all agree on. We like stability, don't we? We like permanence. We want to know what is lasting. What can we count on 
to endure. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So he, he talks about tempor his temporary. He was, he was um, dwelling in tabernacles. He was a very temporary dwelling. It was, uh, he was sojourning. He didn't have, have um, a foundation. He didn't have anything that was a lasting, permanent home in that place. But the next verse, verse 10 says, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for permanence, wasn't he? He was looking for something that would last. I today want to try to encourage your heart in this time of uncertainty. We're uncertain concerning our health, concerning our job, concerning our, our country and the way it's going, concerning our very life. I want to encourage your heart today with some things that I've listed and want to uh, uh, rehearse before your ears, some things that are absolutely certain, some things that will last forever, some things that have... Uh, foundations that you can count on to endure. Again, our text verse said, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Why do we want to rehearse these things? Why do I want to try to encourage you concerning some things that are everlasting, that we may fear before God, that's why, that we may give Him reverence and awe. I'm not talking about the kind of fear that cowers because you're afraid of Him. I'm talking about the kind of fear that says He deserves my respect. He deserves all the, the, the all because He's awesome as I come before Him. And the first thing that I noted is this, salvation is forever. Praise God. We ought to be able to uh, thank Him. We ought to be able to get excited about the fact that salvation is forever. What a miserable existence it must be to go to bed every night worrying, concerned. Uh, did I do good enough? Did I mess up bad enough to uh, lose my salvation today? Well, let me answer that for you. Yeah, yes, you messed up bad enough. I messed up bad enough. But God in His grace and in His mercy and in His goodness is big enough, strong enough, and kind enough to ensure our salvation forever and ever and ever. You see, the fact is, if any sin were to separate us from God, if any sin had the capacity to cancel out, to take away, to cause us to lose the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, then all sin, then any sin would because sin is sin is sin, right? In God's eye. And so if, if there were any sin that could take our salvation, then all sin could or any one sin could. And so the fact is, yes, we've messed up. But God is gracious. God is merciful. God is kind. And His salvation endures forever. I remember the time whenever I had preached and I, and I was standing at the back greeting people as they left. We don't do that anymore. And, um, and this one lady had been coming here about three years. She came from a sister, from another church. I won't say which one, but she came from another church and they taught that she couldn't be sure about her salvation. And she left out of here that morning and she, and she grabbed my hand and she shook and she was grinning and she hugged me and she said, Preacher, I got it. I got it. And I said, Hallelujah. What'd you get? And, and she said, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm going to be saved tonight when I go to bed and I'm going to be saved in the morning when I wake up. I'm saved in Jesus' name. What a liberating feeling and, and in fact that that is. The fact is that Isaiah 51 and 6 said, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Praise God, salvation is forever. A believer the believer is sanctified 
forever. Hebrews 10, 14 said, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You and I are delivered in Jesus from the penalty of sin. I thank God for that. I do not have to worry, and you and Jesus do not have to worry about coming under the wrath of God because Jesus has already taken that wrath. That's what he endured when the Father turned his back upon the Son. He endured the wrath of God upon sin. And Jesus Christ went through that because he loves you and he loves me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The next time whenever the devil tries to accuse you and tries to drag up old debts and old sins and old things that you've already confessed and repented of and been forgiven of, and the next time he tries to drag them up and drag you down by them, you go to this verse and you tell him, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? See, that's what you gotta, that's what you got to be sure about. Are you in Christ Jesus? We're delivered from the penalty of sin, and we're being delivered from the very power of sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, such a wonderful, wonderful verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but, is, but, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. We are being delivered from the very power that sin has in our life. Why does sin have any power in our life? Because we still inhabit this flesh, and the flesh is weak. Sin don't have any power over the redeemed spirit but it does have power over the weak flesh. And so the Bible tells us here that God gives us the ability. He makes a way that we can overcome the temptation when it comes into our life. We are being delivered from the power of sin. By the way, let me just add a thought here. The one who would condemn others, the one sitting in this room who would sit and condemn others because they messed up, you hypocrite! You're a sinner too. You mess up too. You may not mess up in the same way, and yours may be hidden better. But the fact is, there's nobody in this room who is absolute in the flesh who is absolutely perfect and don't mess up. That's why we've all admonished to keep short accounts with God. That if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The fact is that the Bible says, turn to Galatians 6. The Bible says that if you see a brother in a fault, if you're spiritual, which you must claim to be if you're condemning somebody else, if you're spiritual, instead of condemning them, instead of pushing them down, instead of uh, 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 stepping on them, you would try to deliver them. You would try to help them. Galatians 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. So if you're spiritual, you'll reach out to them, you'll pray for them, you'll go kindly with kind words to them and try to help them. Not talk about them and run them down and, and try to add to their defeat. And then ultimately, we shall be delivered from the presence of sin. Bless God. I look forward to that day. Revelation 21 and 27 said, And there shall in no wise enter into it, it being eternity with God, uh, holy Jerusalem, new Jerusalem, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the eternity that we have to look forward to. A place where sin and temptation cannot get to us. A place where we're delivered finally from even the effects and the presence of sin. Salvation is the will of God. Salvation is forever, and I want you to know that salvation is the will of God 
for every person. I believe that. I know there are those that disagree with me about that. They're hyper Calvinists. There's also extreme Armenian. Listen, I believe the truth is somewhere in between. And I believe the will of God is salvation for mankind. The Lord's not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. But it's to us we're long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. It's God's will. Hebrews 10, 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I will do thy will, O God. You see, I believe that all three persons of the Godhead have an active role in the salvation of every person. We're drawn, according to John, according to God in John's Gospel, chapter 6, we're drawn of the Father. Jesus said in verse 44 of chapter 6, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. So because it's God's will, we are drawn unto salvation, unto Jesus for salvation by the Father. And then we are saved by the Son. God the Son. Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It was the Son who went to the cross, God the Son, that went to the cross and paid our price. So we are drawn of the Father, we are saved by the Son, and we are sealed by the Spirit. God the Holy Ghost seals us under the day of redemption. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So all three Persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, are active in the salvation of every lost person, every converted sinner, everyone who places their faith and their trust. The work of Christ is forever. It is once and for all. It is lasting. Hebrews 10, 10, by the which uh, will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Bless God, he don't have to do it again and again. The Bible uh, declares that if you could lose your salvation, the only way that you could be saved again is that Christ would have to go back and go through that and do it all over again. The Bible says he did it once and for all. He did it right, and he's able to save us to the uttermost. <clears throat> I use for a, for a proof text, Lot. That man, Lot, sacrificed his testimony, his witness, before his family. In fact, he lost his family on the way out of that sin to pray place he lived, Sodom. But the Bible declares, Peter, God's man, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, declares that he had a righteous soul, that he was saved. In other words. And then, I want to encourage you to give honor and glory before the Lord because His Word lasts forever. Psalm 119 and 89, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. The Word of God is infallible, inerrant, and inspired. The fact that it's inspired means that it's God-breathed. Peter didn't, Peter didn't write Peter's words. Paul didn't write Paul's words. They wrote God's words. And God guided them and showed them, yes, their personality may have come through, and yes, their experiences may have come through, but God showed them what he wanted written, and they wrote God's word unto us. It is inerrant in that it is without mistake. God's holy word, as inspired and as given, is without mistake. It's, uh, it don't contradict itself. It, no matter what men tell you, that it's contradictory and all those. No, it's not. Scripture's its own best commentary. And you study Scripture, and you study it in context, and you study the meaning of it, and you'll find out that it is inerrant. It is infallible. That simply means it cannot make a mistake. 
Not only does it not have heresies in it, it cannot err. It cannot make a mistake. The Word of God is sure it is settled. The Word of God will not pass away. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word shall not pass away. Now that tells us something else that's not permanent. We think about this earth as being permanent, don't we? No. This earth is temporary. This earth is going to pass away. It's going to melt with fervent heat in the judgment in the last day. Even heaven, heaven above, the one that's there now, has been contaminated by sin, hasn't it? And so God said there will be new heaven and a new earth. And because the first heaven and the first earth are passed away. You see, all that which has been contaminated by sin will be purged and will be made new and will be made permanent and will be made lasting. His word abounds, abides, and assures. God's word abounds in that it does accomplish that for which he sends it forth. It accomplishes it here in this room and it will accomplish it through social media for those that will hear with understanding and turn their heart over to God, he can accomplish in their life of what he intends, whether that's drawing them closer, whether that's drawing them unto him, unto salvation or what. It abides in that it is everlasting and it assures in that it gives us confidence as we move forward. If you can't be assured in your salvation, if you can't be assured in your faith, if you can't be assured in your God, if you can't be assured in his word, you just move about in a wishy-washy manner, don't you? Because you don't know what to believe and when to stand. But I want you to know that His Word comes with assurance. You can be assured that it is true, that it is lasting, and that it will endure. The Holy Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is forever. Jesus is forever, Matthew 28 and 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world or the end of the age. Amen. Jesus is forever. Jesus did not come into being at Bethlehem. You see, Jesus was in the beginning with God. It was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost in the very beginning before we have any record. And he gave us a record of the, of, of the beginning of the world and, and our world and our thing in Genesis chapter 1, didn't he? And even then, in the first verse, we see, we see all three persons of the Godhead. Jesus is called the Creator, the one who created and by him and for him all things are and were created. And in him all things consist and have their being. So, so Jesus didn't begin at Bethlehem. And Jesus left heaven, in matter of fact, and robed himself in flesh, became one of us. So Jesus is forever. The Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost is forever. Same person. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, same person. Is forever. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Forever. God the Father is forever. Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, is forever. Our security is, last <clears throat> forever. We have an eternal dwelling place. And that gets back to more exactly to our Sunday school lesson this morning. Our eternal dwelling place. That psalm that we all love so well, 23, says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever don't it? says forever. We have an eternal dwelling place. Um, Psalm 111 and 3, His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endureth forever. 
Hebrews 9 and 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So if we have eternal redemption and heaven is forever and, we, and that's our home, then we have it forever, don't we? We sing Amazing Grace and that, that great song, when we've been there 10,000 years, we have no less. Than, listen, there's no years in eternity. <laughs> I know that's written for us because we, we can only comprehend years, right? Time. But time will cease. Before man, before the creation of the world, there was no time. There was just eternity. And after all of this, there'll be no more time. There's just eternity. And we'll be with Him, with the Lord, through all of it will one day also have an eternal reign with Him. Revelation 22 and 5, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Did you know that in heaven, in eternity, future in heaven, in eternity, when we're with Him, did you know that you'll have something to do? I can't tell you all what that means. I know we'll praise Him. And, but I believe that we'll have something to do because, because having something to do brings fulfillment. It brings satisfaction. Without it, you'd be bored. And it's not going to be a boring place. And so I can't tell you all that that means. But I can tell you this. You'll be fulfilled. You'll be satisfied. You'll be happy. It'll be a marvelous time. I've got one more point. Don't miss this one, please. Please don't, 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 don't let me lose you. The sinner without Christ will perish forever. Revelation 14, 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. I could go to other scriptures that prove that point. Torment. Revelation 20, the last verse, verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In that lake of fire, you will not be burned away like a piece of paper, and then it's over, as some teach annihilation. No, no. Jesus said it's a place where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. In some capacity, and I don't fully understand it, but in some capacity, you will be in torment forever and ever and ever. It's a place where the fire burns with brimstone, that's sulfur. When you inhale burning sulfur, it burns on the inside. It'll literally burn your lungs. So that tells me that the torment and the torture will be external and internal. Not to mention the mind and the things that you have memory of and the opportunities spurned and, and all of that. But I have good news. There's no reason for it to end that way for you because Jesus paid your debt. Jesus went to the cross for you. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again so that you could have life, eternal life. Do not, you do not ever have to end up in that horrible place, that place of torment, that place of everlasting fire, that lake of fire you, was not even created for you. It's for the devil and his angels that followed him. So today, won't you choose Jesus? Won't you cry out to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, I trust you. My faith is in you. I believe that you died and rose again. I believe you did it for me. I, I, I trust you as the Savior that I need. Will you do that today? Let's stand. Dear Father, we, we thank you that there are some things we can count on to last forever. Your holy word, the salvation that you give us. Father, we cringe at the thought of folks who will 
perish forever, who will be in torment forever and ever. Today I ask for you to draw unto Jesus Christ, unto salvation. Make them know that you've made a way for them to escape that, that they can have, have salvation, that they can have heaven, that they can have a wonderful existence with you forever and ever and ever. They don't have to go to that horrible place. In Jesus, we ask you to save souls, encourage hearts, draw people close to you. It's in His name we ask. Amen. Will you let Jesus have His way in your heart today? Will you say, I'm tired of holding out and holding back? I'll be saved today. I'll plead for mercy today and forgiveness. I agree with you, God. I'm a wretched sinner. I thank you for your mercy, for your kindness. Forgive me, please. When you cry out, Jesus, I, I trust you. I realize now that you did all of that for me because you love me. I want to place my faith in you. Save my soul. Will you do that today? Maybe... Maybe you're one of His. Maybe you've been saved and you've been walking in fear instead of faith. This COVID thing has you just kind of locked down and locked up. Just kind of walking in fear. And you say today, God, I want to claim your goodness. I want to claim faith instead of fear. I don't want to be paralyzed by fear any longer. I want to walk in faith. That don't mean being careless but it does mean trusting in God to take care of you and not be gripped by fear you cannot walk in fear and faith at the same time cannot do it whatever your need will you tell it to Jesus Jesus is a friend Jesus can help you. He's really maybe the only one that can, depending on your need. Will you give it to Jesus? 